Today on the CIO Lifeline, we have Michael Kickel from Insurance Management Company based out of Erie, Pennsylvania. I sit down and talk with Mike about cyber insurance for organizations. What are the things you should be looking for? How can you prepare for coverage like this, which is important coverage to have? What do insurance companies look for when finding companies to offer this type of coverage? And if you're doing all the right things, why do your premiums keep skyrocketing? Later in the episode, I spend a few minutes with Darius Brockton. He is from the YouTube channel, Hey, It's DJB. And we talk a little bit about fiber backbones and connecting businesses across the U.S. After all, if you're going to be cloud ready, this is a very important component of that. Welcome back to the CIO Lifeline. With me today is Michael Kickle. Michael's with Insurance Management Company, and today we're going to talk about cyber insurance and some of the challenges that go into assessing businesses and some tips on how or what companies should be thinking about when seeking coverage like this. Michael, thank you for joining me today. Anthony, really appreciate you having me on your show. Um, yeah, to give you a little background of our company, we're a fourth generation family owned business. We have about 150 clients, ma mainly manufacturing, social services. Um, we do some construction holdings as well, but you know, our firm is geared up for commercial insurance. And one of the things, you know, we've been talking about cyber insurance um, for a number of years now, because it's not a matter of if it's gonna happen, it's when an event is going to happen. Great point, yes. And how long have you been offering cyber coverage, cyber so insurance? So cyber insurance has been around probably for the better part of 10 years now. Has it been that long? Yeah. Wow. 10 years this coverage has been around. What, what do you think the genesis moment was that made this a viable offering for companies? I think it, it was always an offering. I think it was when you look at the mass events that have occurred, uh, you look at the pipeline being hacked. You look at, mm. um, you know, for instance, you know, how Target was hacked. Yeah. You know, Target was hacked by an HVAC contractor who they went after the middleman to get into a bigger Target, literally Target. Billion dollar Target. No one's immune, right? And that's a scary thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ransomware, the proliferation of that, um, it used to really flood the airwaves on the media. Uh, and I feel like that's toned down now, but certainly the number of attacks and the volume of attacks hasn't slowed down, even though you may not be publicly seeing it, but uh, it's still, still a scary threat, very real. It's one theme I've had throughout this conference is uh, how important employee training is. Because oh, it's huge. You know, if you want to be 100% secure, you fire everybody, right? I mean. It's the clickers. That's that's usually how you end. Maybe maybe usually is always, but I, you know, training is super important. You know, so when you're looking, when your company's looking to find a company that's insurable, if that's a word, mm -hmm. um, I, I take it you're looking at, you know, their cyber footprint, but but uh, is is the presence of a training program or these things that you're also looking yeah. for? So, so, so what I, there's two analogies that can boil down the insurance and we'll look at it from the corporate side and from the client side. And what we do is with being client advisors and insurance agents and brokers, you know, we'll meet with the client and then we'll, uh, we'll go and do an analysis, study what they have, study their business, see what their, the ebbs and flows are see what their suppliers are, see at learn as much as we can and see where there could be an identifiable exposure. But here, I'm going to take it back two steps. When I talk to a client, we always say, let's paint the picture you want the insurance company to see. Hmm. Let's, let's show them all the good education training you're doing. Let's show them what, what, uh, what controls you have in place, what your contract IT providers are doing. And then from the insurance company side of the house, the old adage is, and an airplane pilot, when you fly blind, you fly high, right? Yeah. So that's a great analogy. 
Now we try to, what we do in our job is to read the insurance contracts to make sure it's giving you the sizzle and the sauce that you need. Okay. Then we present that to our client and say, Hey, here's why we think you should be with maybe this insurer over insurer B over insurer C. Now these insurance companies all have different underwriting requirements mainly reverting around MFA, offsite backups, um, control access, meaning like a, a, a small control panel has access to key data. You know, they want those universes to be small because we talked about earlier, the more people clicking, the more chances things can happen. All right. So I feel like, so would, would you call that your top three? If, if advice for IT leaders out there, what they should be looking at or focused what they, on? What they should be doing. And it's a shame if their current insurance provider isn't doing this thing. Their current agent should be reaching out to the insurance companies because underwriting requirements change every single year. When you look at the okay. different like um, major hacks that occur, they put widespread event exclusions on. You know, you, you, the insurer needs to have a trust and open communication with their broker or insurance agent. You know, it, it, it's so encompassing that I don't want to get. No. Super a, a mile wide here, but basically in the high level, your insurance agent or broker should be reaching out to the insurance markets, asking for various underwriting requirements, taking those requirements, summarizing them in a document, and then letting and working with your IT staff and providers saying, hey, here's what we need to do to be cyber healthy to make sure, to your point, A, insurable so we can get a renewal. And if we want to look to move coverage, because coverage can be now it's starting to taper off a little bit. But if we want to move coverage, we need to have these certain underwriting requirements in place. And as you all well know, implementing IT solutions at companies, it just doesn't happen overnight. No, it's, it's a journey. And, and there's, you know, there's a change management element to that because the employees are usually taking the brunt of any solution that's introduced. And it sounds like, you know, this is a partnership that you have to have with Absolutely. your businesses. This isn't just window shopping insurance. Mm -hmm. Like some of the premiums that I've been exposed to, it's just like, wow, you know, this is, I mean. They, well, to your point, you know, some people were, uh, some folks had to bear, you know, 70, 80, 90% premium increases on their cyber liability lines. Just year over year. Just year over year. Wow. Hey, we're taking it up. And, and it's it's very frustrating. Yeah. It's very strenuous. To, but even, but, but let's say they're doing the right things. There's still some bleed, you know, because cause you're based, I mean, you have a, you have a pool and, and you're going to have some, some, I'll say bad insurance candidates in that pool so we're all kind of paying for it on some level right I yeah mean, i mean you, you you would like to think the law large numbers right yeah everybody contributes you know how come this or company a had a major loss i've been good for 10 years why are my rates going it, up exactly my point yeah but yeah. The, the the thing of the matter is and i think it's the problem is only going to get worse because then these hackers then are basically being underwritten by the insurance companies because the insurance companies are like, well, if we pay them demand or rants and the FBI says don't pay, but then when you have a manufacturing facility that's running off of so many widgets produced a day, an hour, a minute off of this one machine and it's shut down for yeah. a week, two weeks. I get the theory, right? You don't want to, it's like, you don't, we don't pay it. Yes. You don't want to pay the kidnappers demands because you just enable it. But, but that's, yeah. There's reality, right? And and the sim simple fact of the matter, and, and these ransomware, I mean, you can buy ransomware kits. Like I could buy in the dark market or my own ransomware kit and spawn my own attack for my own business. And some of these threat actors run it like a business. Oh, you know, they, they have a department yeah. to help get you back. We're going to work with you. We have an That's, IT solution to help put you back together. Yes. And we're going to teach you how this will never happen oh, again. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean they're they're ethical. Yeah, no, the it, ethical it's ethical hacker. That's yeah, another one. Do you do you see this market continuing to thrive? As a kind of a bad way to phrase it, but is it become a point where all right, listen, we're not going to be in this insurance. We're not going to offer this anymore because it's just it's dragging our bottom line. There's too many successful attacks. So th that's a great point. All right, so if I pivot off that, are there 
simply customers that you have insured that you simply have to fire because they haven't held up their end of the bargain. Not that they got attacked, but you, but they become too much of a risk. And I say that because I just want to reemphasize the point of staying on top of your protections. Just because you haven't been hacked and you think you're doing the right thing, just know that you might become uninsurable. Yeah, so you, you Or maybe I'm full this, of shit. No, no, no. Hey, we are a little bit, right? Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> no, you see it. It's, yeah. So it's an interesting conversation you're having here. One, if you are doing the right things, we will find a home for you. We will find a home for your cyber. Okay. There's other ways to structure where you can, maybe if you're not fully cyber compliant, you can look to a crime insurance policy to help offer some I call it back end into cyber, like a little social engineering or some funds transfer fraud or computer fraud. Mm. Insurance companies definitely get in and out of the game after they feel a certain exposure, Mm. right? A certain loss ratio. Hey, this isn't working. Okay. You know, and the law of large numbers aren't picking up. But, you know, I, I, I think I just saw a report down here that said that the loss ratio of insurance companies relative to cyber were somewhere in this high 70%. And they're now dropping down to the 60s and even high 50s, but we're on that 65% loss ratio. So they're making a little bit of money on cyber liability. And, and All right. So I think the obvious tie-in is that companies are becoming smarter. Oh, yes. And is there a particular industry that, that you've seen as more buttoned up or, 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 or industries that are like, yeah, we're not even going to touch them because... Uh, they don't have it. Together. You know, those who, those with the most data, you know, I would say, you know, you look at like healthcare organizations, mm. maybe you look at <laughs> folks that have um, tens of thousands of online customers with profiles set up. You know, that's a big exposure to an underwriter or an insurance company. Okay. Now, some of them handle it all day long, and you see it how many credit cards do you process a day, and how many do this. But I mean, for like at a certain point in time, you can get a million dollars to cyber liability coverage just for your standard manufacturer, 30 employees, maybe doing five to 15 million in sales. You can get a standalone cyber policy for 2,500 to $7,000 mm-hmm. and that'll pay dividends. And you know, is that your uh, annual or monthly? That'd be annual. Yeah. Oh, you know, now some policies for a larger companies that have a hundred employees, 200 employees, you know, multiple locations around multiple states, you know, then you're talking a a little bit bigger premium dollars. But again, when that CNC machine gets shut down and 30 other CNC machines get shut down, you're going to want to pass that off to somebody else. That's tough. Yeah. Because, you know, I look at like cyber insurance and and most of, I'll, I'll say, traditional IT, they just look, you know, typical legacy C suite boards, rooms. It's just pure cost. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, and it's not, you just don't ROI that, right? Maybe opportunity costs. Well, what, what's the cost of being down? And if, and if, but if you've never been attacked before, there's a little bit of a hard sell. To- it is a very hard sell and it's a culture driven thing, yeah. especially some folks that don't really have, haven't had any product liability claims. They haven't had any property claims. They may have a couple one-off auto accidents here and there, yeah. hit a deer, something like this. And they really use feel insurance as a burden. It's another cost to your right. point. It's just another, ugh. And then that's when you get in the mentality, hey, I want it done cheap and I want it done this. It's like, well, that, that's not the value-added service that we're going to bring because we want to yeah. bring in the technical aspect to know that when just because you didn't have a claim for 20 years, but when you do have one, you're going to want the insurance to respond, indemnify you, make you whole, and make sure you're good across the gamut. And, and, and you know, the Federal Trade Communication websites has a data response plan that's free to everybody. Mm. That is at least a starting spot. Okay. Because some of the cyber liability contracts are like, hey, we need a disaster recovery plan, a data response plan. And you, being a manufacturer, just knows how to run a CNC machine to run his company. He's like, I don't have time for that. Right. I'm trying to get product and employees and get right. it out the door and then get paid because I'm getting stretched by G on terrible terms and conditions. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. we try to levy that off onto the insurance company as much as we can. And plus, we have articles where we're like, hey, let's pass this off. This might be of value or here's the next thing to um, take advantage of. But again, it's open lines of communication and 
utilizing resources that the insurance company has as a value added service and not just a bottom line cost. Yeah. It sounds like you enjoy what you do. It means there are days you're like, all right, you know, f this, I'm done. Well, you know, that's an interesting point. And I don't know how serious professional I have to be here, but yeah. the hardest thing is getting past a gatekeeper. Who, you, all right, so who is the gatekeeper? That's in a businesses? great question. So my first day on the job, a uh, great company I work for, they were like, hey, look, you, to grow the business, you have to get experience. Hmm. So let's go out there. You know, if you bring an opportunity in, we're going to teach you the right way to do it. Because I had no experience in commercial insurance. I was like, well, oh, f***ing gatekeeper is probably some person who, you know, is taking orders all day. Hey, print this, print that, mm -hmm. do this, mm -hmm. call that. Did you book this? Da, da, da. So this is now their time to shine and get a little bit of power. And, you know, you, the old <laughs> adage, water off a duck's ass. Well, it definitely yeah. is true. But so, you know, what I did was I was like, I'm just going to go in a different door. Mm -hmm. So then I started to walk my way into the shipping department and ask who the CFO, CEO was. And I knew all these players before I would go because I'd research companies good for you. left and right. That's good. And then that's really good. I had to be nimble and pivot. But, yeah. you know, naturally that's the hardest part is getting your information to the c-level people who you know you can make a meaningful difference you care you treat every dollar as if it were your own right yeah. and and you trust and you do what's right you do the old golden rule do unto others how you want to be treated but how do you get that message when it's bottlenecked by a lady or man at the front desk who won't give you that opportunity i'm with you and i tell takes you your it, folder and throws it right out it, in front of you it's hard i mean because i you know run it where i'm at and and i the volume of random outreach is, is overwhelming and you know and, and i'll get you know, like linkedin for example i'll get a request and i'll look at the, oh okay all right someone in my industry or serves the industry sure go to network as soon as i hit accept boom you know hey do you need blah, 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 you know and and it's just very robotic approach it's it's hard there's no and i don't mean to cut you off here yeah. here's the problem I'm old school. I want to call you. I want to talk to you. Yeah. I want to see you. I want to develop a relationship. And majority of my clients have become friends and lifelong friends. That's because it's I a have, relationship. I do have man. to like you, right? You could. I shouldn't say that because it, it it almost sounds backhanded. Like, but the simple it's the simple fact of the matter. I want to like to do business with you. you. You have a great product. Probably there's a lot of people that have great products. But if I think. If I just think you're a jerk or I, I wouldn't want to have happy hour with you, God damn it. I mean, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to work with you because all the things you talked about, this isn't just I'm walking into a hardware store and buying a bag of screws. I mean, this is a multi step journey. I'm I, always I, on call because things happen at the worst time. You know, Friday on the way out the door, somebody got their hand smashed in a press. That's terrible. Yeah. I'm not going to leave my client high and dry for the weekend. Yeah. I'm going to go see how I can assist, see what we can do to help them. Because you know OSHA is going to become a knock and oh, eventually, sure. you know. Yep. So you try to really add value to the whole transaction. And customer service is a huge thing for me. You know, you service beyond expectation. And now for a few minutes with Darius Brockton. Darius is from Lecom. Of course, not the Lecom I thought. So faux pas on my side. But we get through it. Darius, how are we doing today? Doing really good, really good. Very excited to be here. So you're a system administrator at uh, Lecom? Yes. All right. Yes. So how big is that team? Our parent company is TIS, their infrastructure services. Uh, Lecom is just one of the many op codes that is under the uh, parent company. Uh, it's just Ferris and I, but of course backed uh, with Velocity or VNet. Okay. That's our uh, MSP. That's your MSP? Yeah. yeah so, but it's a two-man team. Two-man team. Okay. Yes. And uh, so my impression of Lecom is just a massive footprint. I think they own half the city. Yeah. Then. Sure. So oh, sorry. this Lecom is not Lecom in Erie. This is Lecom out of Detroit. So, ah. so yeah, it, that's for, uh, so then we which we knew about actually. We don't make a lot of that's stuff. fantastic. I, I just been corrected. I have the wrong Lecom. So <laughs> yeah, as we were just mentioning, yeah. So there's a le I think it's like something to do with medical or something like that or health. Okay. Uh, for Pennsylvania, but we're based out of, uh, well, yeah. our corporate office is based out of Warren, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. I do uh, my homework. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah. 
And all right, so let's uh, think about the uh, footprint you guys cover. You're laying telecommunication lines. We are uh, contractors with uh, Comcast, okay. uh, as well as uh, DTE, which is our energy provider for uh, Michigan. So we do power and we also do communications. So whether it be coax, fiber, which is where we um, specialize in. You specialize in fiber? Yeah, underground okay. construction as well. Okay. So And, and so, you're, so you con contract with other big bells. You mentioned uh, Comcast, right? Oh, yes. Uh, what about um, like a Verizon or AT&T? Yeah, have so, a well, that, that would be under a different operation company, which I mentioned our wireless company, such as Thayer Wireless. Yeah. Uh, they actually are partners with Verizon. Like they do a lot of cell, uh, cell tower work. Okay. Uh, for example, so. And and so, are you nationwide? Are you regional? Are you primarily on the uh, mid, like Midwest East side? Okay. Um, I'm not too sure what they're. Of course, I can't speak for them. Uh, what their plans are, like yeah, what they're trying to expand onto. But uh, okay. at least for now, Midwest for sure. You hear about cloud being everywhere, right? And and these a lot of these uh, vendors, they're forcing the issue. To me, it's, clouds a freight train you can't avoid. You're right. Um, if it's up to Microsoft, they'd only offer cloud and, I'm telling <laughs> oh, you, and they're not far from that. Right. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. but I think of these companies in these remote locations and, and so then companies like Lecom help connect the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's your sense of, of a, this cloud freight train that, that I mentioned, but also when it would actually come to fruition again, you think of rural America and these remote places you mm -hmm. just don't conveniently connect right and you're not going to run a business off satellite internet you know you're just, no. yeah you just got to really map out like what the needs are figure out what is necessarily to be off-site or in the cloud but of course you have to have some sort of uh, physical connectivity at your uh, location one well let's talk about that location or physical location because as your dependencies increase getting out to the cloud. I think on average, uh, businesses have 12 SKUs of some for cloud subscriptions, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're beholden on that connection to the outside world. And, you know, the cynical side of me says, okay, I can bring in another carrier into the, into my facility, but all roads meet at some point. Right. Um, so am I, am I being cynical or am I being accurate? And, and do you, what would be your approach? A recommendation for a business to have that true redundant connection definitely you know you don't want to have a redundant connection with one yeah, connection yeah. because clearly if their entire network fails you're you're, you're also down no matter what how many lines yeah. you have with them you want to ensure that you have uh two different reliable um internet service providers that uh, providers at least i'm also for um, maybe even having like a third like cheaper alternative like for example the verizon modem now that you can get that is driven strictly off of cell towers yeah you can still run a network uh, of, yes with those things so yeah um i would say you know make sure it's not the same carrier of course because again although maybe uh a fiber line was cut uh but their coax uh network is still up just ensure that it's not the uh same um isp all right so you have a youtube channel yes um, what's the name of that channel? So it's Hey, Hey, it's DJB, uh, all together It's literally my initials, nothing special. My channel consisted of multiple things. I did tech videos. I did reactions to content online. I did comedy skits as well. I don't like to stay in one box. Yeah. Like I just kind of like to try my hand at most things. What really took off for me though, at that time was reactions to, so again, reactions are, you have whatever content, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be, um, just on the internet site in general. You watch it, you share, at least in my opinion, you share your actual opinion on it and not just sit there just watching that laughing, ha ha ha, but you give your takes on it. And like, so, so the content's playing and you're reacting. Correct. So yeah. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a big metal head <laughs> and, uh, there's this, uh, phenom. She's 13 years old, Harper, mm -hmm. you know, so she's a screamer. I mean, she's metal. And, oh, man. and so there's a gazillion channels. It feels like people watching her videos reacting to it. And, uh, there's, there's a draw to that. Mm -hmm. Like I actually, you know, it feels genuine. As of right now, I'm, my foot has been much off the pedal due to, uh, me becoming a parent. Um, oh. my, my daughter, Ezra, my wife, Kiara, um, she's, she's a two year old, you know, terrible twos, uh, very smart, but very strong minded. Congratulations. But thank you. And then, you know, just focusing on my, uh, my career. 
Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time. Pleasure meeting you. And Same I'll here. be sure to check out your channel as, I, as I, I hope all of you will as as well. So thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. And then I was onboarded by a Fortune 100 uh, insurance company and kind of flew flew through the ranks. And they wanted to move me to a place called King of Prussia. King of Prussia, PA. Never going there. <laughs> Sorry, Look, mom. Sorry, dad. Yeah. yeah. Sorry if you're from there. Yeah. Don't mean anything. But yeah. if you were to turn this camera around, you'd see a beautiful lake that, you know, we could take yes. advantage of. And it's not just, in King of Prussia, not in King of yes. Prussia, but in Erie, Pennsylvania. Yes. You mentioned commercial insurance. Did you do any anything on the residential side to start? Like, no. Were you hazed? <laughs> no, no. There's no like, hey, you're going to go sell renters insurance right. and then right. step up to homeowners. And I just don't get how people are operating when you care and try so much then you see somebody else not how, how are they sustaining themselves how are they putting a roof over their head how are they getting a car a phone you know do going this and that but guess what at the end of the day when i look out there at that water that same person's looking at the same view as me yeah <laughs> right you know not in king of prussia yeah definitely not yeah well I'll leave that alone <laughs> yeah work from home. <laughs> um, but cut, cut, no.